having come into the house, let us turn ourselves toward God in worship. When Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel her dominion. The sea looked and fled. Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams and the hills like lambs. Why is it, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back. O mountains, that you skip like rams. O hills, like lambs. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of of water. Almighty God, we gather in worship and we pray your spirit guide us, not just gathering us in, but flowing through us in this time. May we experience Christ in the moment, resurrected, confronting, and comforting. And may we be transformed. May we be in awe of your wonders and curious of your call for us to be children of the living and loving God. Amen. The book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 11 through 18. Ah, you who rise early in the morning in pursuit of strong drink, who linger in the evening to be inflamed by wine, whose feasts consist of lyre and harp, tambourine and flute and wine, but who do not regard the deeds of the Lord or see the work of his hands. Therefore, my people go into exile without knowledge. Their nobles are dying of hunger, and their multitude is parched with thirst. Therefore, Shoal has enlarged its appetite and opened its mouth beyond measure. The nobility of Jerusalem and her multitude go down, her throng and all who exalt in her. People are bowed down. Everyone is brought low, and the eyes of the haughty are humbled. But the Lord of hosts is exalted by justice, and the holy God shows himself holy by righteousness. Then the lambs shall graze as in their pasture, fatlings and kids shall feed among the ruins. Ah, you who drag iniquity along with the cords of falsehood, who drag sin along as with cart ropes. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of these words.
from the great storehouses of heaven, we are nourished. We are sustained with an enough that is the bounty of God. And from the overabundance of the bounty of time, talent, and of treasure that we are entrusted with, we return a portion to God in thanksgiving, in obligation, in acknowledging that God is God and we are not. And so let us, in this time, in supporting of the mission and the ministry of this congregation and the community of faith at large, let us offer ourselves to God. This scripture reading is Genesis 11, verses 1 through 9, the Tower of Babel. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city in the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. May God bless the reading of this word. May God's Spirit inspire wonder and curiosity within us, guiding the thoughts of our minds, the meditations of our hearts, and the words of my lips on this day. This is the third in four sermons, worship services, that are in this particular series. We have been organizing ourselves, organizing around anger and the energy of anger, organizing around humor, even in the times when we don't find things funny, organizing ourselves on this day around curiosity. And finally, we will be organizing ourselves around imagination. These are four things that are lifted up as important identifying tools, aspects of leaders and leadership that are desirable. And since we as a people of faith are called, are set aside as a, a priesthood of all believers to be leaders in whatever way God has called us to be, it is important for us to consider these things, how we harness the energies of anger to do the work of God, how we can balance that anger with good humor, moments of wit and levity and joy and rejoicing. And on this day, we are seeking curiosity. Well, the texts that were lifted up on this day might not not inspire curiosity at first. The Isaiah text is a, is a text about, well, about issues of injustice 
a very common theme in the prophets. In fact, throughout much of scripture, we are told that God has a special concern for issues of injustice, a concern for those who are marginalized and dehumanized, set aside. And that would fit in very nicely, it does fit in very nicely with the way that the Babel story is often taught, the way I certainly learned it when I was growing up and even much of my adult life, which is now, I think, just as long as my youth, (laughs) if I want to think about that scary thought. Babel was a a myth, a folk tale. It was designed to teach a lesson. Why is it are there so many languages? What are some of the concerns that we need to have as humans about how we interact with each other in the broader world? And we are told in the Babel story that, well, we don't need to be too prideful. We don't need to try to make ourselves into little g gods or even try to usurp the power and authority of big g god It explains why there's so many languages, the Babel story. And there is a note of injustice in it. In the pride of human beings building this large tower in a story that sort of seems to be randomly set in the book of Genesis, we hear that as the tower goes taller and taller, It took more and more effort and work and investment to keep raising it up ever closer to the heavens. A thin spot, maybe. An artificial, human-created thin spot. And as the tower goes higher and higher, as we are seeking this exponential uh, unending growth, people begin to die. In order to achieve the the goals of society, leadership within society, sacrifices were being made, willingly made. How do we choose? Who to sacrifice. That's the Babel story, it seems. It's a social justice story, an injustice story. But today we're talking about organizing curiosity. Where does Babel bring in curiosity? Well, the text itself, in the way that it has often been taught, is influenced by commentaries and the the thoughts of people of faith throughout over 2,000 plus years now. Millennia of commentaries and theologians and people of faith who are saying Babel tells us why there's so many different languages and the dangers of human pride, this idea of, of constantly being able to build up bigger and bigger and taller and taller and better and better. But there's a midrash, an ancient Jewish commentary A midrash that comes out of Babylonian captivity, it seems, along with the Talmud and other reflections on Scripture. A midrash that Jesus himself would have been aware of that offers a different view of the text. Interesting, isn't it? To dare to conceive that there might be other views to the text. Kind of makes you wonder what they could be. What other possibilities God may have in store if the text itself can be experienced differently. Does it make you curious at all? The Midrash suggests that God became increasingly concerned at the loss of life as the tower was being built. God became increasingly concerned by the desire to go higher and higher and how material was being valued over and against 
humans in humanity over and against creation and the goodness that was proclaimed in the creation stories. In the Midrash suggests something else. That as the people were building the tower higher and higher, as society, this, this homogenous society was seeking to exert its uniformity and the singleness of purpose, the desirable things, as it was a, trying to be elevated and grow in importance, wealth, power, prestige, whatever it may be, as it was trying to, the people who had become cogs in the wheel began to lose their identity, their individuality. The glorious diversity of creation was being flattened in a way that seemed to be objectionable to the divine. The Midrash suggests that God really likes diversity. It suggests that the multiple languages, ways of being, ways of interacting with each other and with God in this world are not so much the result of a divine punishment to keep us from excelling, but it's more of the divine interest in all the glory of creation. And so the Midrash suggests that this text is one that is pushing us to get interested in each other again. To set aside the constant building and the seeking to elevate, the, the pride-driven or anxiety-driven attempt to secure whatever it is we're trying to secure and to actually be curious about those around us. To sit down and have a cup of coffee or a tea, not just with those who we know so well, although those relationships can always be and should be bolstered, but to seek out those who maybe we are working alongside with and we know nothing about. To have those vulnerable one-on-one -on -one conversations, to share something of our lives and to hold each other as being far, far more valuable than the materials that are used to build. The Midrash suggests that this Tower of Babel story and the way things unfolded was a way for God to push us to be curious, to be inquisitive, you know, sometimes we learn best when we have to struggle for the answer. And one of the big struggles we have is being able to communicate even when we speak the same language. So as we seek to be leaders, to respond to God's call, to organize ourselves for this thing that we're going to be doing after summer vacation, as we harness the energies of anger, as we seek to balance our lives with those moments of levity, we are called upon to be curious, to be inquisitive, to go to the neighbor, the stranger, and to reveal something of ourselves and to embrace something of them in return to learn about each other, to seek. In the Christian Church Disciples of Christ tradition, coming out of the Enlightenment, post-Enlightenment, and everything else that is going on in the early 19th century, late 18th century, that post-revolution period, there was a heavy emphasis, there is a heavy emphasis on engaging the mind. 
we are given the freedom of thought to interpret and experience scripture with the expectation that we will be doing so responsibly and within a community setting. To be curious, to take our insights and to lay them before others, trusting that they will receive them and offer us feedback of the spirit that is revealed to them. It is something that works in community. It seems to be a desire of God for all of us, wherever we are at and however we might think and organize our thoughts. We are invited to be curious, to organize ourselves around it, to experience others, even those that are very different from us and to learn to value each other again as good creation, human beings in the fullness, to value us above material growth, tall towers, and the things that dehumanize. It's our invitation as church today as we are organizing for that thing that God is calling us to do and be. It's our invitation to be followers, inquisitive, curious followers. Thanks be to God. And amen. We live in communities. We have the communities that we are in regular contact with, the people in our neighborhood, co-workers, friends, and family. We have the community that we carry in our hearts and those that are in our minds. We have the community that is shifting, the broader community, those who we are only aware of as images, as descriptions of words on a page or those of our imagination. We bring that whole community with us to worship. And we carry that whole community of Christ, that family of God, we bring them all in prayer. Asking that they might lift us up as we lift them up as well. Almighty God, we acknowledge that it has been another week, a week where the things of this turning planet continue to amaze and astound us, a week where we have felt at times overwhelmed by all that is going on and amazed at some of the things that are not happening. We lift up, O oh God, in this week, the leaders and the leadership those who are called and set aside, those who are responding, those who have responded, those who are fulfilling their terms of service, and those who are seeking new terms. We lift them up to you in prayer, O oh God. We lift up communities of faith those that are wrestling with this moment and all that has gone on to shake the foundations that we have built our institutions upon. We pray for those communities as they are seeking to be faithful to their calling, O oh God, as we are seeking to be faithful to our calling. Pray for ourselves, for our individual households, for our well-being and our wholeness. We pray for those whose names we know, whose faces we can imagine, and those who remain nameless and faceless to us. May we all be restored, O oh God, to your glory 
and in the name of your Son, a resurrected Savior who taught us to pray together as a people of faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On that resurrection morning, people of faith went to the tomb, and a strange thing had occurred, something that was curious, caused them to wonder. The rock had been rolled away, and when they dared to peer in, the cloth had been folded neatly and laid aside. And they remembered, we remember, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he had taken bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in the remembering, they are transformed. And they remembered again that on that same night after the meal, Jesus took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to you, O God. And then he offered it. And he offered it to them saying, this is the cup of a new covenant, symbolizing my blood, which is poured out for the remission of sins. Drink of this, all of you, in remembrance of me. And in the partaking of the feast, they are renewed. Almighty God, we celebrate the welcome table. We remember. We are transformed. We pray that the bread might fill us and the cup might inspire us. We pray that as we share this meal together with people of faith, as people of faith, we might be brought together as a community to experience each other again, to renew our relationships, our unity, and to learn more about each other, being inspired by our curiosity. We give you thanks for the gifts, and we pray, O oh God, that we might be nourished and nourishing. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Having come into this space again in our hearts and our minds from wherever and whenever we have chosen to gather, having worshipped, having been fed, fed by word and fed at the communion table, we are now invited again to go forth, to go forth in the ways that we have been gifted with, not to build tall towers to expand our power, authority, or prestige, but to go forth seeking to know each other better, to build relationships, to be inquisitive, to be curious, to share the wisdom and revelation that God has given and to receive from others what God has shared with them. So let us go in peace. Let us go forth proclaiming the good news of God with us. Let us go in the ministry, in the message, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ, in whose name we rely and pray. Amen. Amen.